je m'adresse donc euh, à tant à Didier Dieudonné que à Monsieur Mr. Dieudonné ou Mr. Haddon. How do you react to these these problematics, to these things in terms of investment in your own ports? Perhaps Didier Dieudonné and uh, Mr. Haddon, uh, right after. Yes, yes, good evening all. Um, really, um, we don't really discover something new uh, tonight. We are quite used uh, to address uh, these topics on a, on a daily basis, uh, as a matter of fact. We are not used when we talk to our local partners to do that in such an aggressive and ambitious way. Way. It would be. Uh, it, it's in, interesting that it's a large deep sea port, the desert, and uh, uh, we, uh, we 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 are uh, perhaps too uh, small and too. And perhaps we should. Uh, we, we 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 tend to not use such direct words, uh, direct wording. And it's quite interesting uh, that it's a large deep sea port who comes to us and presents things on the local uh, scale. In terms of investment, uh, yes, indeed, um, we, we can hear the, the magnitude of the investment. Uh, um, how do you build your investments? How do you construct your investment plans for the future? Well, indeed, we are very well in a consistent uh, problematics with what we just saw on, on a scale, uh, the scale of our inland boards. We are indeed trying to adjust to the economic actors' demands and requests in relation to evolutions that happen at the European level and the world scale level. So we are really in this sort of uh, uh, perspective. The question for us is always to to try to adjust the level of our investments. Uh, these investments have to be planned in advance, uh, anticipated. If you look at this uh, uh, container terminal in Strasbourg, um, in the course of 10 years, we have multiplied by two and a half the throughput of the, the port. Uh, it's easy to say that afterwards, oh, it was right to invest. But when you think uh, what was the decision and what was the information we had 10 years ago uh, we we say we, we, we can say we we, we uh, took um, a risk it was risky uh, we were right to do so it was the right timing to do so but it's not that easy to time the investments uh, and through the innovations that we have seen here by uh, by Paul uh, it's easy it's it's difficult to project oneself in in a changing world so the question is really a question of um, how you look at how you evaluate uh, the future needs of the actors on the territories, the actors we want to to have come to us in seven, eight, ten years, because that is the time you need to develop an important project. That's the timeline uh, for a project that requires land use and important projects. On, on Strasbourg, the northern terminal is an investment of about 30 million euros on ten years years and um, you don't do that just by the snap of, uh, of fingers uh, you have really to, to plan to anticipate it and uh, it is not um, always easy you need sometimes uh, to transform a whole area you know, in Strasbourg, just like in Baal, we are talking about urban renovation and uh, refurbishment because it has impact on the city itself. We're right by the city and we have to conduct that in the uh, relatively short time frames and for very important stakes indeed for the economic development of the city. We're talking here, yes, of the, the Port du Rhin uh, area and the relationship with the Kehl port. Um, on the, on the German side, we are talking about the investments on the northern side of the city, northern side of the port, 
beyond the investments on the container uh, port. What well, a question for an inland port such as Strasbourg is to really to question uh, the future needs of the economic actors of the territories for the years to come. So you really have to review and to address the whole structure of the port organization and it's very much linked with the development of the city. You cannot um, you cannot um, um, you have to integrate the evolution of the city, the evolution of the metropolitan area nearby. We talk about multimodal accessibility and uh, indeed for massified transport, uh, the accessibility is rail and barges and we have to develop uh, here massified transport. But if you want to forward the goods, you have to have local road accessibility because it's no use to have wonderful full port equipment if you cannot access that from the inland areas. And here again, uh, this has an impact on the way the city operates and is structured. And again, you have to anticipate this and to try to optimize what can be optimized. And that is the role of this uh, cooperation between the upper Rhine ports, to try to imagine a development that would be mutualized, that, that does not multiply uh, redundant investments in the various ports, but really um, uh, draws on the assets of each port to try to offer um, in, the, in the least, with the least cost, uh, possible the equipments that will be needed in the 10, 20 years uh, uh, to come. More river, more intermodality, more uh, synchromodality. So, Mr. Uh, Hadorn, how would you uh, describe, um, you know, on the, the port of Basel, there are enormous transformation happening. And we're very curious here in Strasbourg to understand what are your strategies in terms of space use and structure, and beyond that, the alliances that you can Imagine. What is the positioning of this Swiss sport, as you call it? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps uh, let me be back to this image of this, this immense, this large ships of uh, 20, 24,000 uh, TEUs, as, as Paul, you, you described. Uh, first of all, it's a question of communication. If you draw, if you start to, to conceive and to draw these images and to try to present these images uh, to the politics, uh, the, the, the first time they won't follow you, they won't accept it. Um, it's um, it's uh, a little bit of a, a difficult uh, thing to apprehend for them. Uh, we have worked on communication uh, for the last two or three years. Uh, we have uh, visited twice the port of Rotterdam, uh, once with our uh, board and uh, the other time with the uh, some representatives of uh, the uh, canton of Basel and Basel uh, Inland, and Basel Campagne, and the second time with the transport committee of the National Assembly in Bern. In order to be able to have a direct communication with the politics, uh, you have to look at this these 40,000 uh, deployments of the four, the port of Rotterdam, but it could be Anvers, Antwerpen as well, um, to realize that the situation the supply of goods in a globalized world, what that is all about. And that is not the choice if you want globalization or not. It's a question of how you control it, how you master it, how you you ride with it. It's in order to to accept it and to um, how would you say it? to 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 accept it in a sustainable way. Well, what I mean is that um, and to start to think about it and to address it. How will we tackle these future developments along this Rhine corridor? The Rhine corridor will stay and will, will be the most important um, uh, goods flow corridor in, in Europe for a question of uh, population density, for, yes, of course, because you have the, the, the core of, of Europe, the banana, this European banana that is that is there in the midst of Europe on, on the European continent. How do you 
tackle this. And that's the, 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 the second part of the thinking. Um, it is clear that you need a multimodal strategy to be able to tackle this so that you have the best uh, uh, potential with the least investment. If you look at the needed investment on the rail side, it's necessary, of course, but um, you will reach a price per kilometer that will be too expensive. So you have to have a trade-off here, and you have to look at the uh, trends of automation on, on road transport, as Mr. Mr. Ham said, described, it, it will come probably faster as one might think, because if you look at the private cars, with the automation of private cars, uh, there are, um, um, this, this is progressing at a very fast speed. But uh, let me be back to this uh, multimodal strategy. For these inland ports that have interconnection potentials, it is very important to develop these areas that have a multi-modalities, potentialities. Now, if you invest for, say, a local servicing, and not uh, quite local servicing, but on European levels, you need platforms that have really the capacity to concentrate and to exchange large good flows with all possible modalities. The same in Basel. There are lots of expectations and uses, um, an urban area, of course, which is very important. Uh, Sixty years ago, the port was all alone by itself, and uh, there was nothing around it. There was no urban zone nearby. And since, uh, of course, 30, 40 years, this has changed considerably. But is the solutions uh, won't be found if you uh, stay put uh, where you are. You have to move. And so you move. Yes, we do. We do. We try. Because of all this, this communication uh, with the, uh, the politics, uh, the we realize that you have to have a, a discourse, a stance, a position which you can explain, and it has to be up to the logistics needs, and the sustainable um, uh, transport systems and urban developments. And uh, for two, three years, we have been uh, communicating with the politics, uh, saying that uh, we have to develop, we have to find ways to develop this multimodal logistics platform and thankfully uh, between uh, Germany and Swiss we have found some land um, which fulfills these ambitions. What is the surface of that land area? It's at the border, right, Weilam uh, Rhein. It's, um, it's uh, land that is really fit uh, for that purpose. It's just nearby the highway and the railway as well, and uh, very accessible for the boats. It's, yes, it's large enough. It's uh, 120,000 square meters. Uh, but it, it does uh, satisfy the needs of uh, 700, 800 uh, meters long trains, which is the European standard, so there's direct highway access for both countries, and there's also a direct access for, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Erat, um, um, this, this air transport. And that's what we have to do. You have to really uh, have the, the, the big access partner with one another. It's like in, in a passenger transport, you have uh, large buses and, and and high-speed trains, and then you have the uh, metro trains, and then you have a bus and the, the inner metro. And it's the same uh, with, uh, we have to develop some more hierarchical uh, systems and uh, that are apt to to unload and reload uh, the goods on, on various uh, transport modes. And of course, computerizations uh, w will help us along that way. We are always talking about the physical infrastructure. As I said, it's the basis uh, for building uh, the future. But you have to go one step beyond. Um, we have to really 
use uh, the um, um, computerization and have computerization infrastructure, and we have to develop that among the upper Rhine ports. We have started with the container uh, area. We want to have all uh, uh, container terminals uh, linked with one another, and we want to have a computerized system that is really working as a network to better manage the capacities, the assets, uh, customs aspects. There's a whole computer uh, chain here that has to be implemented uh, uh, from the terminals here in the region up to the uh, deep sea terminals uh, north of this area. So you are extending the port or displacing it? Or is it going to be a new um, a port? Is it going to be a, a, a new international multimodal platform? Yes, that's exactly that. Uh, this is We have this um, uh, political agreement agreements uh, which allows, enables us to build this new multimodal hub. And once we will have done that, we will uh, free some uh, land for the development of the city, urban development. Urban development, which is included in the, the is it is it already planned? Yes, it's a dry land project, as we call it. Uh, for the city of uh, Weil am Rhein on the German side and Hunang on the French side. And uh, they're both partners in this project. With the construction of, uh, of an island, is, is that part of that project, Rhineland? Yes, yes, indeed. It's very dense, so that uh, um, the sale of the land uh, sort of um, offsets um, uh, the cost of, of uh, investment. How, how is it organized in terms of e business model, economic model? But it's true that urbanization uh, will be the fact of uh, public authorities. On our side, the port side, we will develop the logistics platform. It's very clear that we want to separate the, both functions here. What is very important, I think, is um, to have the possibility uh, is to structure <laughs> on the, 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 in, in time uh, these investments. In politics, you have always expectations uh, for the next four, five years uh, that you are going to be re-elected. So that's the politics cycle. And so uh, they want to have something done in five years, which is not doable in a re-urbanization project. And that's our challenge. Well, indeed, yes, we can see that it's a multifaceted project because uh, IBA and the port projects uh, are linked to one to another. And with the alliance uh, with the other uh, Rhine ports, what are you thinking about? What are you projecting? What is the purpose of this alliance? I think we're going stepwise, Mr. Dieudonné. We're, we're starting with a computerized information exchange system with all our partners. That's the Rheinport community with uh, Mulhouse, Basel, and uh, the Weil am Rhein port. We start with a, a pilot application this year. And uh, we will continue step by step. We will progress along the Rhine uh, in the direction of the north, Ludwigshafen, Strasbourg, Mannheim, to really have this computerized platform uh, in terms of uh, uh, river transport. What, what will it be used then? Uh, is it just to mutualize information or to have some real-time management? Uh, both, both. But perhaps uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. my colleagues would, would know more about this project. If you want to add something, yes. Yes. Yes, it's the first uh, real uh, project after two years of cooperations that um, where we, we conducted some studies, we, we started to work together, to, to we, we, we got acquainted to, to, to one another. We were competitors and um, uh, we were, it was a wrong sort of competition, so it was better to, to partner and uh, that's what we decided. And this first project was really a networking of uh, our activities. When you think about networks, you think 
computerized networks because uh, it's easier to do. Um, it is still um, difficult to implement and uh, even with computer systems and uh, information systems you have you still have to adopt a network approach in the heads and in the, in the minds of people. And we have to improve our collective performance with the existing systems. We have to better use our infrastructures. In relation to your infrastructures, you mean, yes, exactly. That's the goal, is to optimize the processing, the processes that we have in terms of unloading, loading on the upper Rhine ports today. Uh, when we have barges coming from Rotterdam or Anvers, they would call in the various ports at the rhythm of the river navigation with the, you know, the um, inexactitudes in, in transit times and the little difficulties that you have on, on such a river. You have to optimize this, this organization so that each port can optimize by itself the, 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 these uh, infrastructures. Just by exchanging information on uh, when the goods, when the boats are coming, when are the goods coming to the port, when they are ready, and by adjusting on a constant and, and instantaneous basis to really build some consistency in a system that is geared towards optimization. We are not in uh, the, the rat race, as Mr. Ham would describe. Uh, we are not. We are part of it. And I think it's interesting, and that's what we want to do. We want to be part of it by optimizing our infrastructures. And that's important uh, public investments also. And so it's also uh, the the, the guarantee that we use efficiently the land that is put at our disposal so that each board has its role to play and uh, is playing its role indeed. Mr. Erat, you have sites in three areas in France. What, what is the point for you to be here in France, in Strasbourg? In fact, here in Strasbourg on the Rhine, it's one of the ports with Basel and Mulhouse. Uh, you have the distance, uh, the land distance, which is uh, uh, very long from the sea. And so river transport can really uh, bring a competitivity uh, to the global transport chain. So on such ports, uh, when you look from Anvers, it, it's a competitive factor which is, which is key to us. However, I would say, and uh, I'll, I'll be in, in, um, in sync with Paul Ham here, um, you have on a permanent basis to adjust to evolutions to a maritime port evolutions. There's uh, Rotterdam, there's Anvers. Um, there is sort of a competition between these, these ports uh, from a month uh, to the next. You have to adjust to uh, their variations of throughput. And those variations are being handled with the ports themselves because you have these enormous flows of, uh, of TEUs transiting towards the Rhine. You have 300 millions of tons that are transported on the Rhine per year. And you have a permanent fight to try to fluidize this transport, this global transport. And that has to be done by partnership between the uh, river operators, between the ports, all the stakeholders. Uh, have to uh, are under stress, positive stress, to cooperate uh, to uh, go towards a better uh, uh, fluidization of the the, the uh, throughputs. What is the difference of, of your trade um, in relation to what Paul Ham described? Well, as a river operator. We are going to be a, in the continuity of the deep sea port, uh, the large deep sea vessel uh, arriving with all the goods that we consume in Western European uh, Union uh, will be stopped in Anders, in Rotterdam. And we have to ensure the link with these ships to bring as fast as we can and the best way we can the goods 
to Strasbourg, to Switzerland, and to the inland parts of the uh, territories. We are completely interconnected with this deep sea um, uh, aspect of the, the goods transport. Any change in the chain, be it in a deep sea port or in Strasbourg or in Basel, again has an impact on fluidization and uh, the circulation of uh, boats on, on, the, on the Rhine. And why then Lille? Well, in fact, in Lille, you have some river uh, infrastructure. You have the Lys, which is uh, flowing north, and you have a direct connection towards Anvers and Rotterdam. So you have the same um, perspective, the same opportunities um, from Lille. Exactly the same, and you can bring the goods on our uh, ships, be it export or import, between the inland part of the territory and the deep sea uh, ports. Uh, Paul Ham, with the evolutions of uh, uh, that that you that you feel on this this region, would you be interested in 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 having a site in one of the upper Rhine ports? Mm. We have uh, clear interests in, uh, for example, also here in uh, in Straatsburg. Uh, Straatsburg, um, uh, uh, Mr. Dionier, he knows that. And um, I think for for uh, the Upper Rhine, it's very important that it's uh, that uh, besides, of course, the investment in infrastructure by the public government, you also need to have the private companies to come in and to invest here in, uh, in in all kind of facilities and you cannot you cannot do it as a as a as a public body on your own so what i think b would be helpful here in this area is that the 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 the, the public government is taking care of the uh, let's say facilitates um, in, in 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 areas but the in, in the end the private companies must come here to invest in in, in port facilities, let's say, uh, for example, in, in, in container terminals, but also in warehouses adjacent to it. And if you want to go there, then you do not want to have the problem with, for example, uh, noise in the in, uh, reduction. So you need an area where you can expand and where you, where you can do your business 24 hours, seven days a week. And therefore, you need a good infrastructure, and that is for the public, and the private companies come here to invest in those kind of facilities. And what you say comes to my mind a, a question, who invests you know, in your projects, um, in, in Netherlands, in France, in Switzerland, who exactly invests in what, in harbors, in, in ports? Let's start with, with you, uh, Mr. Hans-Peter Hadon. Well, we have a rather simple model, that is all the infrastructure questions, basic infrastructure, be it river, rail, road infrastructures, is the responsibility of the public authority, which is why you convinced them in such a, an elegant way by, by putting them in contact with the reality, as you explained. Yes. But it's also clear that all investments in terms of suprastructures, that is, stores, uh, silos, terminals, cranes, that is always the part of private companies investing. So you have to have a clear separation of tasks, but it's also very important that we um, adjust as best as we can in terms of investment capacities. If you take the other example, if the public authority, public body should invest, should bear all the investments, it would reduce uh, the development potential of the site. Th that's the reason why we chose this, this model, this uh, distribution of tasks uh, between the public and private, and we are uh, already um, uh, answering uh, Mr. Hans uh, expectations in a way. <laughs> Didier Dieudonné in France, how is it, um, how is it done? Well, on the inland ports, um, uh, the Strasbourg model um, is a public in 
facility, its, its entire financial autonomy in terms of management, financial management. It doesn't prevent, if, if it were only the port investing in uh, port tools, we wouldn't be able to follow the rhythm that is expected from the uh, business world. So we have subsidies for the large tools, for the large infrastructure, and it's, it's more a boost of the investment than a condition to invest. It's, a, it's coming as a help, but clearly the port wouldn't be able to uh, cope with the needed development. So in terms of large ports, equipment and infrastructure, we have public subsidies that come in and help us cope with the uh, rhythm of uh, the needed investments. And investments, for example, in cranes, uh, container cranes, um, have shown that the rhythm was good indeed. We are not um, having overcapacities. We are uh, coping with the demand. We are trying to anticipate it. But uh, we have traffic. We have traffic increase. And so we are in sync. We think we have the right timing and the right investment level from the port authority and um, with the help of public subsidies on the, this big uh, infrastructure and equipment. And that, of course, the, has an impact on the price of road transport. You know, when a company wants to transport a container from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, that company has a choice to do it by road um, at a given price and uh, we have to compete with that uh, if it's if it's less expensive it will be done by road so if we want to capture a big part of this container traffic uh, we, we can do that with uh, competitive costs in in comparison with road transport which means that if road transport would become um, more expensive we would be even more competitive indeed and we would capture uh, more traffic, more throughput. The big difference between passengers and goods is that in terms of uh, uh, passenger transport, you have authorities uh, that organize services, whereas in goods transport, we are in a free, competitive uh, world. And if you want to capture uh, flows and uh, throughputs, um, you know, you cannot have a, a, a subway pass for uh, the transportation of goods being implemented. You have really to be to live in a competitive world and to adjust uh, your structures to it. Mr. Paul Ham, perhaps uh, uh, you have explained uh, the way it operates in terms of investments. Perhaps you would like to add um, a few words. Already said is that the public should invest in the basic infrastructure, but leave the rest to the private companies. You could easily, uh, uh, for example, here in Strasbourg, um, why does it? Uh, it has uh, two big terminals, and there's an, another uh, terminal coming up in Lauterburg. It is. It's, it's remarkable that uh, that uh, the port itself is also operating the terminal, investing in cranes, <coughs> etc., and going after clients. I think that is a, that is typically something that that a private company should do, and uh, the private company is also chasing for customers. And and uh, I don't say that you are not chasing for customers, but it's it's a different thing. And um, so if you want to be competitive in this area. I think you should look for the best comp uh, com uh, competitive companies to reach that goal. Uh, yes, in Netherlands, in Netherlands, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yes. In Netherlands, also there are very important subsidies for infrastructure, so that the private world can then manage and operate uh, the infrastructure. I think in the transport world today, the big difficulty we're having in managing these adjustments, these very um, quick evolutions of flows of goods transport. So the transport company is having to cope with enormous risks, with flows the, it doesn't control, because without going into too much detail, these flows, as I said, could move from one port to another very quickly. Uh, you have to be very reactive. You have sometimes to compensate or to find the best ways to to 
a balance uh, imports and exports so that the ships are full, always full. So that's, that's a risk the, tr the shipper is taking. And for the competitivity of a region, you have to have um, infrastructures that enable the unloading and loading um, on um, alternate uh, transport modes can be financed, I think, by the uh, public uh, entities. Because if here in Strasbourg we have half of containers going through alternate uh, transport means, that is because we had investments that were done that later enable us to exploit the best uh, transport uh, modes. Uh, I think it's a win-win situation if you, you know, if, if the uh, subsidies can be direct or indirect, but the infrastructure is has to be strong enough uh, that it enables later some competitive uh, transport organizations.